Hmm, I'm interested to see how this went. Huh. Yeah, how did it go? Well, let's take a look at last week. I'm hungry for some answers. Don't Section. be chicken. Let me know how it went. <laughs> I hope you didn't make a mistake. Man, you're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yo, what up, everyone? Welcome back. This is the Players Meeting, episode number three, right after Chess.com Invitational. We will continue to bust these out after every single tour on Tuesdays. So make sure you're always tuned in because we love talking about this stuff. As always, I got my boys with me. The one-time world champ, Chris Smith, a.k.a. Smitty. And the zero-time world champ, the step pup master, Mr. Ronnie Unruh. Hello, fellas. What's going on, boys? We got quite a show for these peeps tonight, don't we? Yo, yeah, man. It's going to be uh, packed with lots of things from chess.com and our takes on what we saw. And I'm telling you what, man, if the rest of the tour is nearly as good as this weekend, we are in for a treat all year. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, you got that right. That was it was uh it was quite the weekend of disc golf. Can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, it was it was a blast. I had a lot of fun watching. Of course, we're gonna recap chess.com. We're gonna talk stats, just the coverage in general, the commentary, Jomez, a lot more. Tonight we're gonna do the top five of the best holes that you saw this weekend at Olympus. We'll also do a wheel of debate. We've added like a million different topics now, so get ready for that. Our audience question and results of our picks from last week and, of course, Survivor League. So lots to unpack, but let's jump right into it. Let's talk what's popping, and let's talk about this Chess.com Invitational. It was quite the weekend. Um, obviously, the top take right off the right off the bat was, was A.B. and Evelina the the maybe the two best stories out there that could have happened uh for is personally at least for me uh and it was uh it was fun to watch how these two these two players that have struggled uh at times over the last four or five years since they've been on tour really figure out a way to get it done and with some adversity at the end with with ab really happened uh to to clutch up there at the end and then evelina the way she uh she performed all day was 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 something special yeah, I'm with you, man. I was uh, I was excited for Anthony to finally get his first big win, but I was really happy for Evelina to finally put it together and do what, I mean, you and I have been talking for the last two years that she's one of the best throwers of the disc, male or female. She's just oh. so accurate. And, you know, to to struggle like she did from the putt, that, that had to be terrible feeling walking up to every putt just – shaking in your boots and dude she was amazing that last round she made so many killer butts yeah and, and i've had the yips <laughs> so trust me i've 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 been there in her shoes and i and i know how hard it is to be scared to putt and you can tell it and, and even in her her uh her post round interview when you know she she admitted to the fact there was times i didn't believe in myself to see someone battle through that and then and then reach that pinnacle again uh, it was awesome. It was really great. Yeah, she made one putt coming down the stretch. I think it was either 15 or 16. It was getting down to crunch time. She made one really nice putt there that, you know, I was – that was the one I thought that she may have some problems with. But, dude, just heart every time. Yeah, yep. yep. she played so, super well. And let's look at some of those rounds she put together. I mean, look at that. 10-12 for the event. Yeah, ten thirty one, man. That's that's amazing. That's that's getting after it, dude. And and it could have been a shot better. I mean, she literally laid up from twelve feet on the last hole. Mm -hmm. um, that could have been. That might have been ten forty. She was a superstar from tee to green all week. That first round, I think. I think I looked up that stat. She had ninety five feet of putts in total that first round. 
um, and was like 25% from C1. But you take that away, dude, she was, she was as good a putter as there was in the field the rest of the weekend and was the absolute best player by a fair margin in the last round. Yeah, she was great. And, you know, we didn't have our top female there, but if Evelina played like she did, plays like she did, Kristen's going to have her work cut out for her, man. And, you know, people say, would she have done it if Kristen was there? We can't speak to that. We don't know for sure what would have happened. I mean, there's probably a little bit of the Tiger effect going on, I'm sure. But I don't care. She was awesome. Yeah. Did you know in the final round, there were six different people that had the lead at one point? So that's exciting, too. And then, of course, Evelina ran away with it at the end. But that's pretty exciting to have the field that close and a lot of people having a shot at this thing. I am extremely excited for Evelina, just like you all, to see her putt the way she putted. Wow. Congratulations, Evelina. Yeah. Now, the other one, the the other winner, obviously, I... Uh, I, I, you know, I have a little special one for that one. AB is definitely my dude. Yeah. Um, Congratulations, the Ronnie. Follow, the, the player I followed the closest on tour, man. And, and, and to see that dude one play so great all week and then, and then catch a little bit of that adversity on 17, man. We, I, I trust me, I'm, I'm sitting there holding my breath. And when, when he turned that, that second shot over, well, the third shot, after mm-hmm. the, after that first OB on 17, I was like, oh, my gosh, here we go again. Could and have then, easily uh, leaked OB. Yeah. And then uh, that – but that tee shot at 18 was composed and just pure. I mean, it was pure, and so was the second. So, I mean, he's he, he showed he's got it in him. Yeah. And he he blew by on his upshot on 17 and just ended up missing the comebacker. So, mm-hmm. that's basically a wash for going out of bounds if he gets up and down from – out of bounds. So, I mean, he didn't. And <laughs> that was, I bet you his heart was pounding as soon as he stretched out and flicked that. But yeah. Yeah. And but I don't, I don't want to talk about that hole because I think we'll probably talk about it later. Well, I do want to say that that putt had to be tough after Rick made the putt that he did. That was oh. just filthy. And, and that's, that's the, that's the other thing that came from the weekend. Rick is still Rick. The dude's got maybe the most grit of anybody out there. I mean, that dude, you, you, he just keeps coming at you. And who didn't know? I, I mean, I, I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way Rick misses this. That was an incredibly difficult putt, and I expected him to make it. And he was a uh, six back after 13 holes. Yeah. And Philo and Kenny were talking about, well, now I feel comfortable if I'm in this position with one stroke per hole. And I'm thinking, no way, dude. 17 is a easy two stroke swing. 18 can be a three stroke swing in a hurry. You want as many strokes as you can have going to those last two holes on that course. Yeah. yeah. And, and Rick made that great comeback and he dominated that back nine all week anyway, but Anthony really only threw one bad shot on one hole. Right. I mean, he, he was still, he made a couple of those birdies along with Rick. Rick just, you know, once he, once he got it going, it was, it was full steam ahead and he could, he could sniff just a little bit of chance. And just like you're saying, Chris, you knew that if it was within four going to 17, he felt like he had a chance and that's what happened. And he picked up two and the emotion when he made that putt, he just knew he's like right there. It's back to two. I got, I got a real, I got a real live look at this thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. If he would have played, I don't remember what hole it was, but if he would have played, it was earlier. There was a green that just got him all three rounds he played it terribly all weekend long and he just got too aggressive on that putt, on that putt with that green. If he just lays up all weekend long, he wins the tournament. So sometimes that super aggressive play can really backfire, especially with these greens, which I thought were some of the most fun greens to play on because you had to truly be careful with your pace because you had to really think about it. If you, hit cage you have the potential of rolling away you had to either hit the center of the chains or you had to air ball just to be safe like you couldn't hit metal because there was always something that could happen and i think that was awesome and most of the greens were fairly clean there wasn't a lot of trees around 
There's the one that uh, Nicholas made the awesome putt through the tree or around the tree. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. And there's plenty of room on all sides except for where he threw it. And then uh, Goose also made a killer putt from behind the uh, sawgrass, that little flick putt he made. But none of the greens were, none of the pins were elevated. There wasn't uh, anything on an extreme embankment it didn't look like. It, I mean, it, you had they had to think about what they were doing. They had to execute at all times. They couldn't take any putts off. But I agree with you, Lucas. I think it was, uh, I, I uh, we'll, we'll hear more about my thoughts of the course in a little bit. But yeah, I, I was, I was, I was impressed. All right, let's look at A-B stats here for the tournament. And there he is, three rounds, 10.52 average, wire to wire, right? Yeah, yeah. the whole way. Well, uh, share the lead for sure. Yep. Yeah, super impressive. And I'm so happy for him. I think just two episodes ago, I told you, Ronnie, he's never going to crack it open. He's never going to win that big one. And already the start of the season, first thing he does, starts the season off with a, with a win, his first win. And I loved that he got a little emotional after because he's a very, you, we talked about this, he's a very dry sense of humor, very chill, go with the flow kind of guy. But man, you could tell how special that was when he kind of choked up at the end talking about his family. The fact that all of his peers came out and congratulated him and loved him and you know, that shows the amount of respect they all have for him and how much they truly do like him. Yeah, like you said, he's a real reserved kid anyway. Um, doesn't really, at least from the outside, appear to get like really high or really low. Although in the past, you've seen him kind of slump those shoulders a couple of times. Um, and that's the one thing we didn't see on 17 yesterday, right? After he made that double bogey, he strided into the next hole, went right back for that, that same putter he's been throwing and knew exactly what he was going to do and uh, executed a perfect shot. But watching everybody give him that love on 18 and the response from the crowd when he stepped out of the trees and onto that 18th green when it was, you know, everybody knew it, it was over at that point. He just had to slide it up to the pond and and, and take his, uh, his, his, so, you know, his victory lap uh, for, you know, for lack of a better term. But yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty special to see the kid get it done and, and watch out, man. This, it, it might only take one for him. It, he he might open the floodgates on us this year. How are you going to beat him on a golf course? Oh yeah, when he's putting like that too. You're it's, not. If, if he's putting like he did and throwing the frisbee like he did, no chance for anybody. None. I, you know, I saw I saw on another show kind of a comparison to 2017 Eagle McMahon. Took Eagle a little bit to break through, and then Eagle won four times that year. I, I see a lot of similarities as well, and. You know, I'm, I'm certainly rooting for the kid. I, I love to watch the kid play. We might have seen the birth of uh, of the next superstar yesterday. Yep. No question about it. I am excited to see what he does. I did want to just share real quick just the top 10 of each, uh, the men and the women. Anything just strike you guys here? Uh, I'm shocked to see uh, Morgan Lenz in there. You know, she's probably the uh, the least experienced player in there. And I do think it's... Not probably what Paige wanted, but it's cool that she's in the top 10. Distant top 10, 19 strokes back, but top 10. Yeah, there's a pretty big discrepancy from 1 to 10 there. Uh, but look at the names down to uh, down to Stacy Ronsley. Those are the uh, probably five of the farthest throwers. Missy's not a big bomber, but she outbombs everybody below her. So I think the women's course was success was predicated a little bit on being able to throw the disc far and easy. Yeah. Yep, I agree. And then let's look at the man's side too here. Anyone sticking out here? Of course, you have AB and, and Rick, but Goose, they're in third. Look right there at the top. Look at the Arizona, the Arizona boys right there at the top. Those three guys with that and that whole Arizona crew were out there, you know, all winter doing it together. And look at one, two, three, you know, mm -hmm. the part of that group. Um, Gavin Rathbun, kind of a surprise in there. That guy's been off the radar with an injury. Uh, but New everybody sponsor. else in there, he, even yes, he even in, is is not a surprise in there. That that dude's a really good player, and the rest of those guys are really kind of the cream of the crop. Well, it's really who's not in there was is is to me is the that's is, the story. Maybe some of, some of the bigger story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's cool to see uh, Joseph Anderson. The second round they said I think was his first uh, lead card at a pro tour event, so that was really cool. And he didn't fold under the pressure, and he very well could have. He had a lot of 
bad breaks, a lot of rollaways. I was super excited about Joey Buckets and listening to him talk after and how nervous he was. He definitely didn't show it like you to your point, Smitty, but he was saying there was some some putting yips just because he was on coverage for the first time. And I loved how transparent he was about it all. It just made me like the guy. And of course, he has probably the coolest nickname ever with Joey Buckets. He's an easy guy to root for. Very happy for that kid. I think it'll be his last time either. That dude can play. No, he's really good. Really yeah, good. Very good. Let's talk some of the stats. There's a lot of cool stats that we may have not had before. Uh, maybe some different things that we're, we're seeing. I know, Ronnie, you compiled a whole list of things. Tell me what you saw, what you're seeing there in the statistics. Yeah, first and foremost, I think uh, the biggest star of the weekend was the golf course. The golf course proved to be not only, and I'm going to, I hope this doesn't sound hyperbolic, but not only really good tour course, I think it might be among the two or three best tour courses already. Um, wow. From the scoring separation it provides to the excitement it has at the end, it, you know the all stars. It didn't it didn't really shine through, but it to me the the star was was certainly the golf course this weekend. A thousand, you know, some of the stats from it. The thousand break was uh, sixty eight point five, which was two and a half strokes over par. Wow, was uh, what it took to get a thousand rating on the golf course. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's not typical for a tour course. Usually you have to be a few under nobody reached double digits in any round eight under par was the best, the best round play. Uh, I love that. I, that's one of the coolest things to me. I like when you're not in when it's not birdie or die, right. That makes it exciting and it keeps people you. close, right? Par it's, it's good to see par is a good score, mm-hmm. right? Par par should be a good score. The course should be designed well enough to make par, you know, something that's valuable and birdies are something that are, is, is something that you've done something great. And that's what the golf course showed this weekend, 10, 20, which is like we talked in the last episode, it took 10, 20 to make the money. That's pretty much the tour average these days, 10, 20. If you average 10, 20 this weekend, you shot one under par for the weekend. Hmm. It's crazy Yeah, for the men's side. And it was nine fifty to make the cash on the women's side, which is really, really good golf. And that was 12 over par for the ladies. I mean, it was this, the golf course really shined a a few stats from the golf course holes one through 16, 163 out of, this is for the men's only 163 out of bounds uh, for the first 16 holes in total hole 17, 98 OBs and hole 18, 204 OBs. Wow. Um, And plenty of those were two by two people at a time, right? Two, two people, one person was getting two, two OBs, uh, out of whack, right? There was so many double bogeys. It was pretty incredible finishing hole. Little stats for your for your champion on holes one through sixteen. Anthony Barella was twenty two under par and had one bogey. That's crazy considering that yeah. even par was so good. Hole seventeen and eighteen, he was four over par with two double bogeys. Um, he never really did figure out hole seventeen. He did have a birdie in the first round, but no, was never even close to sniffing par after that. The most difficult hole of the weekend, hole four. Let's just be honest, that hole's kind of garbage. Uh, it's got to get, it's going to get better when they clean it up. It's going to get way better. Uh, but it played three quarters of a stroke over par for the week. Um, and that was with 70% of the drives hitting the fairway, but even with 70% of the drives hitting the fairway, only 2% were finding C1 in regulation. And we only had seven birdies. Uh, Did you see the way the AB played that hole? Yeah. Cheat code. Yeah. No one else. I mean, I don't know if anyone else played it that way, but as far as coverage was concerned, we didn't see anyone else do it, but he went over the top, got on that left side and then had an easy pitch up. But of course, with that green, there's some roll away potential, which he got, yeah. but it's such a cheat code it, that he can do things like that. He made that hole so much easier for himself. He's a little bit of a human him. cheat code though. So that's not that he's, <laughs> it's tough to compare him with the rest of the field. Hole four is a, uh... It's one of only a handful of the holes there that really had trees in the fairway as well. Mm-hmm. I think that was my favorite takeaway of the course is it looked like a golf course. The fairways were clean. The roughs were brutal. You had to th- you still had to throw good shots. With the exception of just a couple holes, there was the luck factor was out. It was all your skill pretty much dictating yeah. what happened. Yeah, there was there was some maybe some, in some cases there was like really fine lines between a good shot and, and a bad shot. 
but I'm okay with that. As long as there's, as long as good shots are rewarded and the bad shots, if the bad shots get penalized, you know, that's on you. I mean, you control, you control it at that point. I, I, I agree with you. The easiest hole of the weekend was hole 15 that played, you know, four tenths of a stroke under par. We had eight Eagles, but we also had a few eights, some snowmen on that hole, which is kind of crazy considering that it was uh, pretty much just right out there in front of you. A couple crazy stats that I found from the weekend. One that I, I, I sent you guys round two, James Proctor. James Proctor went 11 of 16 from circle two in the second round. He made 474 feet of putts. That's crazy. On those greens. You yeah. talk about not scared of nothing. I ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> that dude is that. There's a reason why that dude's one of the best long putters in the game. Though. And really the last, uh, the last really incredible stat for me is, is even with, even with all those OBs that I mentioned that the course provided for the week, Gannon Burr, zero, zero OBs for the week. Really? The only person I could find with no OBs. That's impressive. That's super impressive. He was kind of quietly in fourth too. I don't know. He was kind of under the radar to me um, as far as this weekend was concerned. I think it was the AB show is why, but. I felt like this tournament more than maybe any tournament I've watched previously, we didn't know much outside of lead card, a little bit of chase card stuff, but there was no uh, news about anybody doing much outside of the lead card. I didn't think. It seemed like the guys who could just play safe this week really played well. Yeah. Gannon, I think Gannon would tell you, he's like, I, you know, I I think he'd tell you he didn't have his a game this week, uh, but he never really, hurt himself. And I think that was really important on this golf course. You had a, you know, a Wichita local here, Luke Humphreys finished in the top 15 and he, you know, he didn't have very many, he didn't have very many birdies for the weekend, but he didn't, he didn't kill himself with OB strokes or, or bogeys. And it seemed like the, the Nate Sexton golf course, you know, just play safe, <laughs> take what, take what the course gives you and, and add them up at the end. Climo had a really good uh, take on that. He said, this course is really easy to par your way around. So he said, just take your pars when you get them. If you get a look at a birdie, go ahead and go for it, but just don't get bogeys. And you know, that's, that speaks volumes as to why Gannon was so far up without taking penalty strokes and just making his way around the course, you know, one shot at a time. Uh, Speaking of Climo, he's on commentary duty for DGN for this tournament. This was our real first experience of the new DGN, right? I know you fellas are super fancy. You have the pro. I don't. Um, So tell me what you thought about the coverage, the commentary, and just your thoughts of DGN this weekend. I thought Climo was really good on the commentary. There's sometimes that him and Philo fed off of each other too much and talked a little bit more than I liked, but his insight on things was... You know, there's a reason he's the champ. Yeah, I, I like Climo and Philo together. Yeah, especially on that golf course with the with him having so much intimate knowledge. You know, not you know not living that far from there. It was it was particularly good. But but I, I think he's always good. I wish we had Climo more often. Do I wish it was with someone other than Ian Anderson? I, I, I I'll be honest. I I don't think he brings anything to the broadcast whatsoever. And. I agree with Chris. There's a times when him and Philo get a little bit going together too much and start talking over each other. But, but I thought it was fine. Uh, I thought the men's coverage was, uh, was good. One thing that was uh, shocking to me was that, or surprising to me was the men. I feel like we're on, on site for their commentary and Terry and Val were in Oregon. I, I, and I'm with Ronnie. I felt like the, the, coverage of the men's was great and the women's coverage that was the best woman we have and neither one of them are much fun to listen to i i I don't want to beat that dead horse too much and i know this is a this is a new show for us so it's it's maybe it's a little bit the opinion's a little new here but i i think yeah she's just not good man her takes from and, and not because i don't think she's good at commentating but her takes about the game now are just so antiquated. She played a whole different sport than what these girls do now. These yeah. girls now are playing what the men did five or 10 years ago, where you had some people that were just going all the time. But now all these girls, I mean, they're, she talks about, oh, I can't believe she's going for this. I'm thinking it's a 30 footer, dude. 
You think this chick's going to lay this up? I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand. But but she was able to do that because she played against such a small field that had any opportunity to even compete with her that she could do that whenever she wanted to. And that's just not that way anymore. There's yeah. there's 10 or 12 women or more that show up every week with a chance to win. And that field is only expand. You know, that 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 pool of women who can compete and win is only expanding on a weekly basis. And it, it's not going to be long before that pool is as deep as the men's is. And you just can't, if you want to win out there on tour against the best players on the planet, you have to be pedal to the metal all day long. I agree. Yep. And, and to touch on your other point, Lucas, about pro tier, whatever we have, I'd be happy with just the middle tier at this point. I didn't, the, uh, the commercial free stuff is, that's what it is. Commercial free, nothing else going on. The uh, Joe Mez coverage, which is commercial free, I tried to watch it today, and the only round that was up was still round one. And the Joe Mez came out on the YouTube before Disc Golf Network. <laughs> so I saw a breakdown where you can, uh, certain months you can get by with just whatever and then bump it up and save yourself some money. But we're not playing much more than what we paid last year with PDJ discount. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I'm hoping that the value increases, right? That, that, that maybe they're just ironing some kinks out and having that second screen, because uh, I'll hook mine up to two TVs and I'll watch that 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 singular hole that they had coverage of going forward and hopefully it gets better. But at this point, yeah, I mean, you could probably get away with that middle tier if you want to save three or $4 a month or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm almost, I'm almost considered... Yeah, I'm I'm almost playing it like a uh like like it's just a little extra donation to the DGN to hopefully increase the production value going forward. Uh, I'm gonna stick with the pro for now. If it if I if I find out it's just blatantly not worth it, then I'm I'll be more than happy to to change my membership. The biggest uh benefit from it is getting USDGC and European open. You can get those that month. A lot of people I don't feel are gonna take uh take advantage of the free tickets to the event. A lot of people don't have an event close enough to make that worth it. So, I mean, I might use mine at DDO. So yeah, if you don't, I'll, I'll take them in. Non-transferable. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, dang. I, no, ID required. I'm <laughs> Blood samples. <laughs> fingerprints. I was like, okay, the fine print got me. Okay. Uh, that was good. That was quick, Smitty. Let's talk about, about the scoring app too. Yeah. Right. We got the new app. What did y'all think? There's a kind of a big blunder that last round. I don't know that that was the app. I think that was just the server at the PDJ going down for whatever reason. I don't think the two things are related. Mm. I think it could have happened regardless of what happened. Even the PDJ website didn't work. I tried to get on during that. Okay. And it was, it was just spinning. I think it's like anything else. You get a new phone and you're like, why the heck did I get a new phone? I don't know where anything is. I don't know how it works. A month later, you're, you know, right at home with it. And I think that I will, uh, I'll adapt and learn how to use the app the way I want. I mean, all these stats Ronnie got for us here, I'm guaranteeing he came off of that scoring app. The the one thing that I do miss from you, Disc, two things, actually. I miss Grip 6. I thought that was a lot of fun. And I miss being able to star my favorite players, keep them at the top. I don't know why that why that won't happen in the near future. Yeah, that's yeah, something I, I can definitely add. I won't say it'll be fixed by Waco, but I guarantee that one is is changed almost immediately. And maybe it's fixed mm-hmm. by Waco. I'm with you. That's that to me. That is the only drawback was my inability to to star my favorite players. Um, and and keep them where I can see them all the time. And before I look at everybody else, I was actually quite the fan of the new app and i and and i'll say i used the desktop more this weekend than anything else because i had my computer up while i was watching and while i was looking at stats you can get so in depth it's even more so than you disc so i was uh i was i was a fan and i'm and i'm with chris i don't think that the uh that the outage on saturday had anything to do with the app um i mean look at you know look at just a couple days before at&t you know went out for the you know three quarters of the country Speaking, Speaking of going, of going out. out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, welcome back. Speaking we got a good show. Out. 
We got a good chuckle. You said, speaking of going out, and we both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's perfect, right? So, I mean, we're, we're, we're struggling with our, you know, with our uh, server for the podcast tonight or, or whatever yeah. it is. I'm not savvy enough to know what it is. So, I mean, it's a perfect example of exactly that. It, it, I don't think necessarily, I don't think that had anything to do with it. But I was, moral of the story, I'm, I'm a fan of the app. Um, and I, and I can't wait to dig into it more and, and really get to using it to, to see what I want to see from the data standpoint. I, I don't fault the PDJ or the disc golf pro tour at all for that. I think that was just something that happened. All right. Well, that's chess.com. I think it's time for us to move in to a new segment. So we're going to do the top five. And this week we are going to do the top five holes at the Olympus golf course. So that the holes that you love the most this weekend, great thing is you both sent me your favorite holes. You also sent me what you thought the other would choose. Currently Smitty is two wins. Ronnie zero wins. We're hoping that changes today. Smitty, if you want to go ahead and start us off, since you won, the ball is in your court, sir. You bet. Okay, I'm going to start at number five and work my way down. So my fifth best hole, the hole that I – and I just picked them on which holes I liked to watch the most, which were the most exciting, and which ones I felt like I would like to play. Okay. So uh, I went with uh, hole number two comes in at my uh, – Fifth ranked hole. I like it. I like the uh, the idea of straight shot with slight hyzer off the tee, and then force the other spin on the second throw. I think it's a fantastic hole. The fairway is clean. The rough is rough. So I went with that as my number five hole. That's All right, a good hole. that is a great yeah. hole. And you know what? It was not on Ronnie's list. I, I didn't think you'd have that one. I didn't think you'd have that one, but but I like that hole myself. It, it just barely missed my list. The hole I have is the fifth best hole at Olympus, hole nine. While this hole, from a statistical standpoint, ended up not proving to not be great because there was a ton of threes, teeing off on one cliff, throw into another cliff with these two giant trees in the middle splitting the fairway. From an aesthetic standpoint, I thought it was uh, – it was an incredible hole to look at and one that while I would never have any chance of getting over, I would like to, I would like to throw it and have a chance. Yeah. It was, it was just fun, fun to watch. Did you see how that played too, as far as the OB is concerned? Did you see what happened with goose? The well, wasn't out of bounds. It's exactly. casual. Yeah. It's casual. casuals. You got to pull it to the top. You got the old uh, Herman Hill rule, pull it up, pull it up free of charge. Yep. And then bang the bang the putt. I thought that was pretty yeah. cool. I like that as a as a rule for the hole too. It just makes the hole even more exciting in my mind. Speeds up play. Yeah. It had to be a pace of play deal because man, I mean that's that's quite the advantage to get a go up twenty five or thirty feet and now well, I've got a twenty five or thirty footer. Well, I didn't pick number five for you. Or number nine. I did say five for the same reason you gave me nine, so if five makes your list, I'm in. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> the number four hole I have at Olympus. Um, again, just from a man, it looks so fun to play. Um, number 15, uh, the par five on the back nine. Uh, you got this huge open fairway um, that's like 50 or 60 feet below you. And you just throw one down there, try to find the uh, short grass. Uh it, it looks, it just looks really fun to play. And uh, I definitely like to get my chance at it. Yeah. Do you think you can keep one straight off that, off the top there without hyzer and out? That's my concern is I'm going to hyzer out off, off the elevation there. Undertaker, baby. That's what I was wondering. Well, I knew you were going to pick it. I, uh, I held it in a little higher regard for you. I figured you'd pick that as your number one dog. But so. it is a point. Yeah, I got a point. Score. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> my fourth best hole. I went with uh, hole 14. Once again, another two-shot hole, another just epic-looking hole. And 
much like the hole two, it's forcing both spins off the tee. This one has a little bit more clutter in the fairway than two, but I didn't feel like it was unfair. So I went with a 14 as my number two hole. Yep. It's a good one. And Ronnie did have this on your list, um, but he had it as number five. Yeah, it's a great hole. Yeah, a really good hole. I like that hole too. Yeah, I imagine you did. So I picked that. You probably would say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my number Stay three. Too. My number three. I went with uh, hole 16. I thought hole 16 was a, a really hard hole. Well, so 737 feet. And once again, man, you just have to throw two really good shots. You have to execute two perfect shots, a, a drive and a, a fairway shot to even have a look at the green. And this green has a little bit of a characteristic on it as well. Yeah. A good hole, man. Uh, it's a, uh... That tee shot's demanding, but if you but if you pull it off, it was uh, it left you in a good spot, but you still had to work for it. Yeah, that was a it was a really really tough birdie, but I agree with you, really cool hole. I don't think I picked it for you. Nope. I'm proving to not be too uh, (laughs) too good at this game. (laughs) My my number three hole, um, obviously. I love straight holes, right? Holes that make you throw the disc from point A to point B without left to right movement. And hole 10, the only way to, to make that two was to uh, was to throw almost a perfect shot. It had a little more slope on that right side than I would like, but it also gave it a you know uh, a little more uh, a little more teeth and some good characteristics too. That even even where AB and Rick were that last round with edge of the circle putts. You had to you had to commit and, th- and 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 put that thing high in the chains uh, because you know a nub on the front and you end up down there in uh, Nicholas Antelaville where where he had to where he had to putt three times. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful par three, that's for sure, man. Not not super long, but not easy to get to with all the low ceiling and perfect line you got to hit. How many holes we pick now? Seven, and <laughs> we we've said, "Oh, good hole every time." So uh, that's you. I could I could have just about picked any hole from the golf course, yeah, with the exception it, of a couple. It was it was not easy to pick five. That's for sure. My number two, um, hole fourteen. Uh, I really love this hole. That tee shot looked really fun. Um, and then uh, I don't know that I'm getting there. At 764 feet with the amount of hyzer you have to put on that tee shot, but uh, I would love to play this one. Uh, maybe throw a roller down on that second shot or something, see if he couldn't get up into where that green is, but I really, really like this hole. That was a, you were way up high on the hill, right? On the tee on that one? It was fairly flat across there, but you were throwing against, across another canyon, right? And But you had, to, you had to boogie it left because of that wall of sawgrass there in the back. Um, mm-hmm. You couldn't just push it as far forward as you wanted to. It was there's so many nuanced characteristics to this golf course that force a shot a little bit here, a little bit there, that just makes the overall design incredible. All right, Smitty, who you got for number two? Number two, I went with a uh, hole 15. I love that hole, man. It's like we've already said. It's just it is almost the perfect hole for a par five and there's a couple Eagles on it. So, you know, the big bombers could get it. I think you and I'd be scrapping for a five probably, but for the, for these guys, fantastic hole, fun to watch and great chances to score. Yeah. I think Simon yeah. got it twice. He got it twice. If Goose, got the first two Goose, rounds. Goose got Goose it twice Jeff. also. Yeah. Yeah. So is it me? Yep, and for f- your final one, and I will say that Ronnie had that one on uh, as number four for you, so that's Ronnie's second point. Ronnie's gonna win. <laughs> we're both gonna get both gonna get two points here. Am I up? Yep, you're yep. up. You want you want to release the same? You think we're the same? Yeah, we are. 
I have, I've got one point. You got two points is what I've got for scores. Yep. Is that, is that true? Hole 18. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. It's a uh, man. What a fantastic finishing hole. Uh, I, I would like to go stand on that uh, tee and see just how high and how tight that gap is. But yeah, great hole. <laughs> fantastic hole. For someone like me who doesn't love man-made OB, I liked it. I liked that they did that on this hole. It's, I mean, th- I think it's super, super fair, but you really have to push that right if you're going to throw that forehand. I mean, you yeah, really keep, have to get it that way. That uh, man-made OB leads me to a point that we haven't discussed yet. And Ronnie and I have already discussed this over the weekend, and I don't know if he agrees with me to this point or not, but I think if they would take the OB on 17's tee shot and push it back or even get rid of it, let people throw into those trees if they want, because that's penalty enough. But I I think that if that OB off the tee is gone or a little more loose, I think 17 becomes the coolest hole on the course. 100%. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And we spoke about it a little bit, right, through some text messages. Uh, the concept of the hole is as high level of a golf hole as it comes. It just, with that OB on the backside of the fairway for the birdie gap, I guess you want to call it that left gap, to have any kind of chance to make three, it was just too punitive because your landing zone now became so small that the luck, it, it, it became luck, right? It became luck whether you could hit that fairway or not. And if that was, yeah, just, there, it's almost, it's just so unnecessary. You have the whole row of cedars right there, which is a which is a stroke penalty just for going into. Why not just now you're double penalizing a player for going back there? Not only are they out of bounds, but now they still have to play from that uh, from that tree line. And they're, they're it, playing it just, this, yeah. They're all doing a reach out flick, and I think even where Anthony about threw his. Uh, second shot there on that hole. I think that OB is probably okay to line that mm-hmm. with OB. Yep, but I, I yeah. If you're, when you're throwing over a hill to a blind spot that appears to be less than 50 feet wide, not even way the best in the way world. Down, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and we saw Rick pull volt off of a stick and get saved. <laughs> yeah. We saw people hit the trees and fall back in bounds. We saw people hit safe and slide OB. It's just crapshoot as to what's going to happen to you as you come over that hill. Yeah, the shape of the hole, though, is, is yeah, I agree with you. If, the, if they move that, it might be my favorite hole if, uh, if they did that, with the exception of hole 18. I think that's almost, I think that's as close to as a perfect golf hole as you can have. And the fact that it's the last hole makes it, makes it even that much better. Right. Yeah, you can yeah, throw a awesome. whole round away. Uh, if they didn't, if they didn't put that drop zone back there on, on the set, on the, on, on the green approach for speed of play, you could see someone throw an entire round away down there. Uh, oh, yeah. But, but I, I loved it. I would, I, Smitty talks about wanting to stand up on that tee to see how far down it is the fairway. I want to stand in the fairway and see if I can get it up to that green. That shot looks just as fun as the first one. Yeah, it's 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 a perfect hole. Obviously, my number one as well. So we know what that means after the scores are finalized. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie left. He did my not job. <laughs> So after all the scores are finalized, we have a first-time winner. Ronnie with three, Smitty with two. Congratulations, Ronnie. Your first win in the top five. Still a losing record, but you're on the upswing. I'm a one-time at something. There you go. (laughs) There you go. go. (laughs) All right. Let's move into a new segment. The Wheel of debate all right the wheel of debate and as you can see we have added in a plethora of new topics 18 to be exact lots of different things to go through 
I'm going to spin. We're going to see who's going to win. And then I will also spin to see who is going to be the pro side of the conversation or the con side. I think Ron, we spun for Ronnie last time, so we'll spin for Smitty this time. Yeah, Smitty so, goes first. Yep, so here we go. Oh, outlying <laughs> headphones. Okay. And Smitty. Pro, you want headphones or you want to outlaw it? Khan says, no, don't outlaw them. You love headphones. You think it's really wonderful. Oh, that's good, because I do think that. All right. I got the timer pulled up. Smitty, you're going first. One minute on the clock. Are you ready, sir? Yep. All right. Here we go. One, two, three, begin. Uh, I think if a person wants to use headphones, they have that right. Uh, there's several people in and around the Wichita area that I prefer they wear headphones. It keeps them quiet, keeps them out of my hair, keeps them entertained. And they're not causing me any problems with their headphones on. I don't even care how loud they put them on. Put those babies on, play your game, do your thing. Um, people have been using them since Barry Schultz started doing it way back in the day with the wired headphones. And he probably still uses them, that cheap old dog. But you know, now in today's day with wireless and Bluetooth and whatever, it's not going to uh, hurt your play. It's not going to get in your way. Go for it if you want to go. All right. With 12 minutes or 12 seconds to spare, um, good argument there. Ronnie, you get to have the counter argument now and tell us why you think headphones should be outlawed. Are you ready, sir? I'm ready. All right, three, two, one, get it. I, I, I guess I don't understand why people want to use them anyway, right? I thought we were there to play golf. If you want to go to the club or go dancing or go bebopping around, go there. I, I, get, I get so frustrated when I'm playing with someone wearing their little buds. And I, hey, man, it's your time. It, it, it's your turn we're waiting on you. What'd you get? Scores are out. Nobody's paying attention. They're listening to whatever is jamming in their ears, slowing us down. Look, dude, we're there to play golf. Let's play some golf, especially in a tournament setting. Now, if it's a casual round, I get it. It's fine. But I'm talking about tournament golf. Look, we're there to have, we're, we're there to compete, especially at my level. I'm playing at the professional level. I, I don't need, I don't need to have to come tell you, Lucas, four times that for you to let me know you got a seven on that hole. I know you did it. Just tell me. All right. Time and great, compelling arguments from the both of you. Everyone that's watching, please let us know. Who do you think won that debate? Do you think Smitty won with his amazing performance? Or did Ronnie win with his extravagant rebuttal. Please let us know in the comments. There was one vote last time. <laughs> We've had one vote each time. And this time, Smitty won. So you guys are one and one and we'll have debate. So let's see who is going to win this one. So please vote. It'd be cool to get more than one vote. Yes, it would. Let's get your real feelings. I think I'm a little more middle down the road, you know, or a little more, excuse me, I think I'm a little more middle of the road on this one. I, I don't care if you're using them, I guess, as long as you're paying attention. But don't make me have to ask you four times what your score is or or let you know that it's your turn or or have to grab you out of the way because someone yelled four and you're still standing there looking like an idiot. Um, if, if you can do it responsibly, do whatever you want to do, I guess. Yeah, that's right, Matt. I mean, I would much rather put headphones in than say, Hey, can I play music and it'd be terrible music? So, but I now, that. uh, I will let Carlos play music anytime he wants. Dude, Carlos, if you're out there, you can, you can jam on my card any day, dude. Playlist rocks, buddy. We listened to a uh, nineties rock, the entire mm. lights league on Saturday. We were in our happy place. Yeah. No wonder he threw past hole eight with that kind no, of, he, <laughs> that boy bombs, dude. He can get it out bombs. 
It was fun. He likes it was, it was fun so with him. He's a cool guy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For me personally, I'm right with you guys. Like, I just don't want to have to babysit you. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like, just pay attention. All right. Good debate, fellas. Lots of fun. Again, please let us know in the comments who you thought won. We're going to move into our next segment. It's not the voice, Smitty. (laughs) Courtesy violations. We are trying to do a show, but you are in our backswing talking, asking us questions. And our audience question, our courtesy violation comes from Michael Schmidt, who says, I think it's weird to have the all-star weekend at the beginning of the season. I'm not necessarily a fan of how the NBA does theirs in the middle of the season either. I think it should be at the end of the season like the NFL, a culmination of the season before. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Well, I think we're going to have the same opinion probably. I imagine that. Well, when when you're always right, there's (laughs) no reason to argue. Oh, boy. So I feel like in in our sport in disc golf, I feel like the – all-star weekends in the perfect spot. These guys are out on tour. You know, they're, they, it's not like the NBA or uh, MLB where you go off and you do something special and fancy and you get treated like a king or a queen. They're still going to be playing disc golf. Like they do every single weekend. Their bodies are beat up. They're tired of sleeping in their vans. They, uh, they just want to get to the next tour stop and, and go is the way I, I feel. And I feel like at the beginning of the year is the perfect opportunity to get some hype built up for the season, see people with their new sponsors, see what's going on with people who are coming off of injury that are in whatever. I just, I feel like it's a good fit at the start of the year for disc golf. I I don't disagree. I think, uh, I think it is. I think it's probably in the perfect spot already. Um, It does culminate the year before. Right. So your, your accomplishments the year before is what get you there. And yeah, by the time the season's over, these, 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 these guys are just ready to go home and, and get a couple of months off, uh, recoup, get some practice in. And, and for us, you know, selfishly as fans, by the time the middle of February comes around, we're jonesing for disc golf so much <laughs> that it ends up being a perfect, a perfect time for us. There is only one thing that I would, if, if they if they ever decided to change it, a mid season all star match play tournament. Mm. I think that, that is, could be a cool way to do it. But but I don't know that you couldn't do that otherwise. Right? You know, without making it the all stars. Uh, I, I, I agree with Smitty though. I think it's it's already in, in in the best spot possible, both for the players and for us as fans. I wonder how they feel about going to the same venue that they were going to play the following week this year last year they went to phoenix and were at a resort and then went to vegas i think Mm -hmm. was the first one last year and now this year they played the safari around at olympus and then which was miserable for them and then uh stayed there a whole week at olympus you know i think there's pros and cons to both sides of that it'd be nice to be there ready to practice the normal course after you were done yeah, and, and it cuts down a little travel for them, right? Um, but I but I think they probably, and, and I know I heard some players talk about it the year before when they they went to that little resort, they kind of got the, they kind of got the red carpet treatment a little bit, uh, you know, some spa days and all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, I think it's a little a little bit of uh, you know, good both directions. Um, but I mean, from their from their perspective is there really going to be a whole lot better than getting to go play Olympus, you know, outside of the physical, the physical aspect of actually playing the golf course. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for your question. Really appreciate you. Smitty hated it. He left. Smitty's out. It's a terrible Smitty's question. Out. Terrible question, Michael. Hopes Michael never comments again. <laughs> Hey, welcome back, dude. Hey, guys. Hey. All right. Uh, Again, thanks for your question, Michael. Uh, Welcome back, Smitty. And let's jump into our next segment, our final segment. Weekly picks, 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 picks. Hmm, I'm interested to see how this went. 
<laughs> yeah, how did it go? Well, let's take a look at last week. I'm hungry for some answers. Don't be chicken. <laughs> Let me know how it went. I hope you didn't make a mistake. Man, you're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm a good sleeper. Benjamin Callaway. Sleeper. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna call upon the old guy. Uh Calabisco. Mm. Um, I think that's a terrible pick, but I like, but I'm going James Conrad. Talk about terrible picks. Shoot, just wait. Just wait. Is he <laughs> is he even in the field? Yeah, he is. He's he's uh <laughs> 10 20 something rated. Um guarantee he finishes higher than both your stupid sleepers. Ooh. <laughs> what are we betting? I smell uh, a bet. Yeah, Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> All we have is your guy has to beat both of our guys or you're taking us. That's it. Yeah. Look, that's fine. That's fine. Perfect. Come on. Let's go, James. Nice. You just saw hmm. things were not looking pretty for me. Um, hmm. I'm going to have to buy some Texas Roadhouse for both these gentlemen. And I have to learn how to also make a bet for the future because the way that that bet went down was not good on my part either. When we look at sleepers, Callaway finished 52nd. So did James. So I feel pretty good there. But then Ronnie had to pick Kale, who finished 28th, and it wasn't even close at that point. You said James will beat oh, Ben no. Callaway. He no, did he not knows. beat Ben Callaway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He believe knows. me. Believe me. It's, this has been etched in my mind for quite some time. I'm very aware. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying I feel good that I was close with Callaway. But yeah, Some, Kale. So, someone hashtag Kale Lavisca. Kale, blew you're my boy. Yeah, we also had shiners. We knew some people were going to shine. And you know, I was like, Dickerson, you going to shine, baby. And Dickerson got 28. Yeah, I'll Smitty, shine my guy. Yeah, Smitty. That was, uh, 20, that was shocking. Yeah, I think we, were all, we were all pretty high on I think Kale, everyone's on shocked. A, yeah. Vinny going yeah. in. I, I, think, I think it just goes to show you, dude. The tour is really hard these days, and 28th is a pretty good week. Uh, it's just unfortunately not, maybe not uh, up to his standards. I did pick Isaac, and he finished sixth, the quietest sixth place maybe ever. <laughs> For real. Um, I wish I would have taken Anthony. I wish I'd have just done it, but pretty pretty happy about getting the sixth place finisher. Of course, yeah, and we uh, we had stinks as well. We had some stinkers, and me and Ronnie both thought Simon. And Simon we showed were, us. We were kind of right till the last five holes. Simon Simon played the last five holes in five under par to, to move up about 25 or 30 spots on the leaderboard. Um, even if he doesn't get a couple of those and, he, you know, he finishes, you know, somewhere backward, you know, even Dickerson or, or, or Heinberg does. And then at 28th or 35th, you know, maybe that would have been, uh, that, that probably would have been a decent one. But 17th place, uh, for Simon and like I said, 17th place ain't sneaking on tour anymore. That's that's 1040 golf. <laughs> good, yeah, that's good. My guy stunk. Yeah, you had that Chandler, pick. It was a good call, Chandler Kramer. You know the uh, the stink of the tournament though. If you had to pick one, Brody it's gotta be course. Brody. It's gotta be man. Um, I'm, Fourth from last. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but I'm interested to. Uh, to find out and see, I know that he hates slow play, hates it. And I would guess that he shot bad enough the first round that he was right on the lady's tails. And, mm. you know, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they had how much time they had in between, but somebody had to be out there moving a basket on every single hole because they pulled the lady's basket out on the holes that, you know, like hole one. The, the ladies' baskets right in the line for the men's hole. Yeah. Yep. I wonder if it's, you know, him throwing the disc his way and not worrying about form anymore. Uh, I mean, I, I it's kind of hard to judge off of one of it. I mean, especially on what like that where it went so sideways with him the first round. He was, you know, really dead in the water 18 holes into the golf tournament. Uh, there may be a little bit of a checkout factor, but I – uh I still like Smith. Smitty picked him as one of his sleepers for the year. And I, I still, I, I still believe in Brody. The guy's a good, good player. Well, but he wasn't very good this weekend. 
Nope. Yeah. Yeah, I like to he think of been, he wouldn't have cashed in a local C tier averaging what he averaged. So yeah. I like to think of this as a triple bogey for Brody, and let's see how he bounces back the next tournament. I like it. Yep. I have a feeling he'll be just fine. I think he'll be okay. All right, we're going to wait till next week to make our picks for Waco. So we will be back on Tuesday next week and our survivor picks, which we still need to talk about. But also next week, we have a real treat for you. Ronnie, do you want to let him let him know? Yeah, so uh, we have a, a disc golf legend that's going to join us uh, for next week's show. Uh, we're going to be talking to the uh, the one and only Scott Stokely. Um, he's, he's got some, he, he's back on tour this year, uh, on the pro tour and, and he's got a new disc manufacturing business that he's working on. He's, he's making his own Frisbee. So, uh, super excited to talk to, uh, to talk to Scott. I mean, he's, he's literally one of the, the big time folks in the history of our sport. So it's going to be a good time. And a 2024 sleeper pick for you as well, Ronnie. That's right. I, we, we, I'll make sure that, uh, Make sure that Scott knows that he was one of my sleeper picks for the 24 season. That's right. That's right. So be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, let's go ahead and take a look at the survivors of the Survivor League. Not many. This was tough. This was very, very well, tough. Well, the over the over under was 10 and a half um, <laughs> on people who make it made it through after that week. And how, how did we end up? We have a total of three people left. Now, this doesn't include our picks. Smitty p- picked Calvin. I picked Dickerson, so we're both out. Ronnie picked Kyle Klein, who finished fifth. So Ronnie is still in. And then Nick and Patsy both picked Matty O, who finished top 10. So they survive. <laughs> so out of 15 people, we have three left. This was a mass exodus in the worst way. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> These kind of things for the way, the way the pro tour is constructed now on the men's side, that pool is so deep of, of guys who can, who can play well, or as we saw this week, not play so well. And, and a little bit of slip up these days can, can really throw you down that leaderboard a long ways. And uh, I, I just, I'm disappointed. I mean, congrats to Nick and Patsy, but I was one stinky round for Matty O for being $150 richer right out of the gate. Pretty crazy to only see uh three out of 15 make it through. Yeah, I will say, I think this course uh, on the men's side really favored people that know how to throw that kind of flexing sidearm and throw it well. I think it really benefited. If you look kind of at the top 10, all of those, most of them had that type, that particular shot shape. They do it extremely well. I was thinking this was more like a woodsy course when I picked Dickerson and I don't think it was quite the right choice or the right course for him. He didn't really have that particular shot shape with the, with the forehand. He can throw a forehand, but not with that kind of angle. I think, I mean, I, I see what you're saying with that shot shape. I think what it was, was a shot makers golf course. The guys that, the guys that all were at the top. I mean, those were, I mean, those guys are, are guys who are shot makers. And, uh, but I, but I agree with you. It does seem like that little flexor with the sidearm for the right hander was, uh, was a big advantage. But I mean, I think all those guys are, were great from both sides. I mean, that's kind of goes sure. without saying this For anymore sure. on tour. There's not very many people that aren't. Yeah. I'm disappointed to be out of the survivor league, but I am not disappointed to have to make a pick at Waco with the new golf course that we don't know anything about yet. I mean, it's just going to be a guess. I'd take Anthony at this point. If I was still in, I don't know that I won't um, you still have that option. I still have that. What I, what I can't take is the, the 2023 Waco champion. Um, That's right. I, I've already used him up with Kyle Klein. So, um, I mean, I'm probably, I feel like I'll probably go with either Isaac or Anthony. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, Calvin is going to be in my thought process too, but you know, we're or still Rick. early enough. Why not just go with the best player? Yeah, Rick. I have to look Rick's uh, track record at, at the old beast. I mean, obviously it's a little bit different now and it's a four round tournament this year. 
which is going to – the cream generally really rises to the top on those four-rounders. So I, I, I get a feel that we just won't see – by the time Sunday comes around of that week, there's we're not going to have a whole lot of surprises in the top 10, top 15. And I know we discussed, I don't remember what happens if uh, all three egg out this week. Oh, yeah. Lowest score, lowest best finisher. I think the lowest score has to, has to be the winner. What if everyone picks Isaac? And I think it sounds like... 20th sounds like the three of us are all $50 richer. Yeah. I think that's what you do. You I think, think it's a split, split at that bill. point. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I okay. think it's the fairest way to do it. Yep. And I think if they pick different players and all get out and two of them tie those two people split. Agreed. Okay. Agreed that. And we're going to show you a video for our 19th hole segment. And this is going to be one of our favorite moments from chess.com invitational. But before we head out, Boys, want to thank you for doing this. I always have the most fun. We've had a little bit of issues with uh, our platform tonight. We've been kind of in and out. We've had some fun with it. But any thoughts before we leave for next week? I'm sure to get through this awesome week, man. It's going to be 70 degrees out for a couple of days here, and I'm going to get outside and enjoy that. Yeah, we got a disc golf tournament this weekend. Uh, mm. And... Uh, and yeah, this is going to be maybe one of our last open weekends uh, coming up without any pro tour for a while. We're 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 ready. We're we're in it now. So I'm, oh. I'm looking forward to to not only uh, getting out there and playing, but I'm ready to watch disc golf every week. And I'm I'm a junkie. Yeah, me too. And what that means is is we're also going to be very busy recording podcasts. Can't wait. <laughs> We'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely excited for it. As always, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Please leave comments. They help tremendously. Please subscribe to the YouTube if you have not already. And as always, take care. Bye bye now. <laughs> Smitty really left. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, you are? Was... All right. <laughs> See ya. Your champion at the chess.com invitational, Evelina Solomon. As your chess.com champion, Anthony Dow. Way to go, AP. Let's go, AP. Congratulations, Greg. Thank <laughs> you.